Good morning. Welcome to Oak Cook Community Church. If you're out in the lobby, come on in and join us. seated. Just real quickly, if you could help us out, there's people still coming in from the parking lot, finding places to park. I know there's plenty of room in here, but you could help us out by moving into the middle of your uh, sections and leave some seats on the outside aisles. That would be helpful. So go ahead and do that right now. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. How are you guys this morning? Well, it is a pleasure to be with you. My name is Cole, uh, and I have been your intern this summer. This is my, my last Sunday here at Oakwood. Um, and I just got to say, it was an absolute pleasure to be here, to be at Oakwood, serving this summer, um, praising and worshiping with you all this summer. Um, and it's going to be tough to leave. Move back into school at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, and uh, yeah, it's going to be... 
I mean, I forgot to do all my packing until today, so between now and youth group, I mean, we're getting everything thrown into boxes and loaded up in the car. So, but it's great to be here with you this morning, so welcome. If you were a first-time guest this morning, uh, we have a welcome bag for you out at the guest kiosk in the lobby. Um, It's got a coffee mug and some chocolates and other goodies in there, so go ahead and pick that up, Um, and we are just so glad that you have chosen to, to be with us this morning here at Oakwood. We also have four ways to give. Um, So should you choose to worship the Lord with your giving, um, we have four ways to do that. There's a drop box out in the lobby. You can pay online. You can text to give. Um, So lots of ways for us to worship the Lord um, with our tithing and with our giving. Next Saturday, one of the ways that we can serve and be a blessing to the community um, is coming next Saturday, the 17th, um, at House of Providence. We're going to be going doing weeding work and flower beds and things like that, um, House of Providence, um, and kind of prettying that place up a little bit. So there's sign-ups out in the lobby. Sign up for that and be a blessing to the House of Providence. Um, and let's just go show the love of Christ to our community. Um, that's just one way to, to do that practically. Friday, August 23rd, we're having an ice cream social. So another great way for you to get connected with the body here at Oakwood. Um, come eat some ice cream. Lots of stuff. There's sign-ups out in the lobby um, for toppings, and there's tickets that are on sale. Uh, Tickets are a dollar per person or five dollars per family, just so we know who's coming and can get an idea of who all is going to be there. So sign up for that, get connected, um, and just be a part of the body here at Oakwood. Lastly, another way for you to get connected. If you're newer to Oakwood and you want to see what we're all about, uh, next Sunday, the 25th, or two, two Sundays from now, sorry, The 25th, we are having a Discover Oakwood luncheon, and this is a great opportunity for people who are newer to come meet the leadership here, um, and just to get a better idea of who we are as a church. So just another good way uh, to get connected, to get plugged in here at the body of Oakwood. Well, I'm going to invite you guys all to stand with me this morning um, as we enter into our time of worship. I love that song, House of the Lord. It's all about praise and bringing our praise to the God who saved us. So I want to read a quick psalm for us. Uh, It's the last psalm in the Psalter, Psalm 150. And David writes this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you um, for who you are and what you have done for us. And because of that, Lord, we have every single reason to bring every ounce of praise that we have to you. You rescued us. Lord, that we were prisoners because of our sin, but you set us free. Lord, we praise you for that, and we're grateful for that. Um, And I pray that that praise would just flow out of us this morning as as we sing. As we hear your word, Lord, that change us um, and just shape us more like the Christ that died for us. So we love you and we thank you, Lord. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. First Corinthians 2.12 says, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. And another translation says, So that we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. There's a line in one of the bridges of this song that says, when you fall, we fall on our knees. And at first, when I heard that line, I thought to myself, what does that mean? God doesn't fall. Because when I think of that kind of line in that sentence, it seems like falling as in tripping or doing something wrong or making a mistake. But when I looked it up and what it's referring to is when the Holy Spirit descends upon us. And we know that the Spirit of God is everywhere and is in our hearts and is always there. But when we think back to that first time that the Holy Spirit descended upon His people, how amazing would that have been? And how amazing is it that we still have that today? So let's worship Him.
Romans 8 tells us, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children.
team. Oh, doesn't that look good? Little tiny bitty M&Ms, some chocolate syrup. Oh, mmm. Mmm. This announcement is brought to you by the ice cream social we'll be having. And we noticed that we don't have anybody signed up yet for that because we're awaiting people. I know we're patient, we're waiting, everybody's always waiting to see, is there something else gonna come up? Like I always tell you, sign up for this and then you can't do whatever else comes up. So be, be part of this. It's only $1 per person, $5 for a large family. Um, and the point is we want you to come here. You know, the blessing is you do know that food eating at the church has no calories. Why do you think we pray before we eat? I mean, we just pray that God blesses that food and turns it into something healthy. What? No, go away. <laughs> Man, our people always want to be helpful. Don't take my ice cream. I do that just because we, uh, we do want to encourage you to, to participate. So many ways. I mean, we're working hard as a church for ways for you to connect and participate here at Oakwood. And they're simple things, they're not rocket science. We're not asking you to, to, to come and give blood or anything. We're asking you to come and spend time. If you don't like ice cream, come anyway and play the games. It's a game night and different things are happening. It's just for getting to know other people. Last night, the men gathered for another one of our grill and chills. And boy, Jim Greco, Lori did a great job. Where are they at? They're usually over here somewhere. There they are. Great job. Thank you, Jim and Lori. And it's just simple. It's just burgers on the grill. Of course, we jazz it up. Jim and I are both from the Chicago area, so we did authentic Chicago dogs last night. Celery, salt, and all. It is fantastic, and the, the corn on the cob on the grill was great. We just had a wonderful time. It's not rocket science. I keep saying that. Sorry, Shane. Shane's leaving us for a job, and you are going to go into rocket science. So, Shane, it, it, is, it isn't rocket science, is it, what we're doing here? No, it's not. It's, it's not. It's easy. It's simple, but it's just opportunity. Chance for you to come together and rub shoulders with people, get to know them. I had such a wonderful time last night talking to all the different men, just getting to know them. And uh, it's, it's a benefit when you connect, but that means you need to give us your time. And so there's opportunities here. There's opportunities not only for social stuff like the ice cream thing that we want you to sign up for today before you leave, uh, but also the dinners. I call them dinners for six, but they're dinner groups. Uh, so far, we have 60 or so people signed up. Uh, it's the second wave of our dinner groups. We, we met with a group of people that we were assigned, and we had three meals together, and now that one's done. We're re-upping the list now and reshuffling it, so it's different people. And so I encourage those people who did participate, participate again. But this is your opportunity, if you missed it, to sign up and be part of those dinner groups 
Don't miss this wave. Uh, again, three dinners together with that group. We need a point person to kind of make sure the texts go out and that group knows where they're meeting and what they're, where they're eating and stuff like that. Uh, but sign up. Today is the last day. We had last week and this week for sign-ups for that, those dinner groups to sign up today. Now here, to just prepare yourself. We are such a people that are used to the last amen, hit the door in the car, we're gone within five minutes. It's amazing how quickly. Today, I want you to plan to take a deep breath just stick around for a little bit, take your time, go through the lobby, because you got to sign up for the ice cream. Oh, it's so good. Did I tell you how good it was? Mm, mm. You got to sign up for the dinner groups. And then there's SOS. This isn't a, a fellowship. This is actually serving side by side. Another way to connect with people is to work together. And we do understand that it is the Woodward Dream Cruise, and we got our motorheads that are definitely not in. They've got to be gone. They're not coming. So those of you who aren't, you can still make it down there later in the day, but we need those who aren't to, to sign up to help us out with that SOS next Saturday. We've been working for months trying to get the date that would work for them and for us, and they just, I wish we'd had it before last Sunday, but they gave it to me like Monday morning that uh, this 17th is our day for the uh, SOS. It's weeding, it's mulching, putting down mulch, and we're clearing some pathways, so it's cutting down some stuff. So yes, you can bring kids. We love it when families work together uh, side by side so children can come and be helpful, but we need adults. We need a good crew. So I'm encouraging you to take some time, go out in that lobby, sign up. If you sign up, you'll receive more information about what you should bring. We'll have some tools, but we'll also let you know specifically some things that you might want to bring to help us with that project. Trusting Oakwood's going to take care of that and do that well. Uh, another thing to mention is the um, Coles love offering. Today is Cole's last day with us. We're sending him back to school. He's got to be there early tomorrow. Uh, but we want to bless him. We paid him as an intern, but we know that we as a church can send him off with a blessing. How to do that? Boy, there was a lot of talk this week about that. We almost brought the deacons up with those things. Remember those plates we used to pass? And I thought, I don't think they even know how to do that. It would probably have been chaos in here. And so we decided to opt for just the box in the lobby. Uh, actually, right there in the back, Tim is holding it up right now. It's just a little wooden box, and it's out in the lobby on a table like this on its own. And that is everything that goes in there makes up the love offering for coal. Now, some people have given online. Melissa has taken care of trying to figure all that out. And uh, we're going to actually count that offering today right after church. I'm going to give him that check tonight to send him off with. And so you can participate. Any cash you put in there, any checks, it, we'd encourage you to write the check out to Oakwood Community Church so that we can write one big check to Cole. But if you've already done one and put it in there, who writes checks anymore? Does anybody write, write checks? I write checks so freak, not, not frequently enough that I actually, every time I write one, I got to stop and think, wait a second, how do you spell out $4,000? I'm still having trauma from a wedding I paid for. Anyways, um, we want you to participate in, in that, just sending Cole off, blessing him. He's been a wonder for us. Cole, thank you. Cole, stand up for us. Let's thank Cole as a church. Thank you, Cole. So appreciate him. And so many of you have come and shared with us uh, what a blessing it was to see a young man from our own rank grew up here. We know some of you probably changed his diapers when he was young, uh, but we're excited that uh, we can be blessed by him and continue to pour into his life as he goes into ministry. So be praying for Cole as he's at Cornerstone this last year, uh, finishing up. He's an RA, so he has responsibilities. That's a resident assistant, so he's got a whole floor of guys that he's got to oversee and, and lead, and along with getting his studies done. So we, we were certainly blessed. I'll pray for him in just a little bit. Um, but after I pray for Cole, we're going to show a video. And this is an introduction video for more information coming next week. The video we're going to show is about Compassion International. We're going to have somebody come next week and share with you how you could participate in something like this. Maybe you've never heard of it before or had an opportunity to be a part of Compassion International. But we're going to let you just watch a little info this week. Next week will be the full presentation. Let me pray for Cole and we'll move into that part of our service. God, we do thank you for Cole. Father, we love the Moore family. They mean a lot to us, the many ways that they blessed us as a church. We're thankful for the kids that they've raised that know you and love you and serve you in their own ways. And for Cole, it's been a blessing to have him here. Thank you for his care and um, diligence to do the work of ministry and to learn while he goes 
We're thankful for the job he did. God, we're praying for a blessing as he finishes up this last year of school and figures out what's next for him, God. I pray you'd make that clear, open doors, closed doors, whatever would be best for this young man going into ministry to serve you. I pray that it would be clear for him. And we pray that he would be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's watch that video. Wolves. We're talking about wolves in sheep clothing that have entered into the church. And we've been warned about this from the beginning of the church age, that there would be those who would enter in that would teach false truths, and that they would in pull people actually away from the true faith of following Jesus. We just want you as a church to be prepared and know the difference between what's false and what's true. And so today we're going to talk specifically about what we should be doing when it comes to false teaching that enters into the church. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me? You don't have to say anything out loud, but I encourage you to pray this prayer. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. Just give that prayer to God. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. God, we do pray that you would be glorified, that everyone hearing this message would be edified, and we pray that Satan would be horrified, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We've got this Sunday, and next Sunday we'll wrap up the book of Jude, and then I've got a couple of Sundays around the holiday where I don't want to start a new series quite yet, so we'll do some one-off messages, whatever PD wants, maybe the uh, top three PDs or something. We'll find out, whatever we do, uh, but we encourage you to be here and uh, participate with your church during those weeks. I think it's September 9th is the Sunday that we actually start our fall, and that's where we're going to start a new series in the book of Philippians called Joyful. Got to get used to that. Not joyful. If I catch anybody saying joyful, you're in trouble. It's joyful. Let's practice that. Ready? Joyful. 
Full. All right, we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks from now. Book of Philippians. Start reading ahead and be ready for that. What a great book, an encouraging book, and a positive book. So I'm encouraged to bring that to you. But we're in the book of Jude. Open up. There's no chapters. Find it there. If you can't find it, go to the book of Revelation. Take a left, and it's the book right before the book of Revelation. Short little book. No chapters, just several verses. And we're just covering two verses this morning. The whole book of Jude, the key thoughts, if you look at the whole thing, it's contend for the faith. Watch out for the wolves. Build your faith strong. Be merciful but direct. Praise God for persevering us, preserving us, I guess is the way I have it written there. This morning, the big idea is keep the faith by helping those influenced by wolves. What do we do with these wolves in sheep clothing? They're teaching falsehoods. And there are people being swayed by some of these things. And in our culture today, it's happening rampant in churches, that churches are walking away from orthodoxy, things that have been taught since the beginning of time. And now all of a sudden, you can almost hear the echo of Satan in the background. Did God really say? That's what he did with Eve. He just questioned truth. That's what Satan did. And he, he, we know what the results of sin have been since that choice. And today in the church, we hear those echoes again as people say, did God really say that this is wrong? And today everybody wants to reevaluate and rewrite and rethink. And we hear that all the time. Let's reimagine, right? Uh, reconstructing your faith. I hear that all the time. One of the things I hate to hear is our young people, uh, teens all the way through college age and young adults, they're re deconstructing their faith. And I understand. Uh, I, I just hate that terminology. Your faith isn't yours to deconstruct or to construct. It's been constructed. Amen? It's based on the foundation of God's word, which never changes. And so you don't get to deconstruct your faith. You don't get to reconstruct your faith. Now, you might need to detangle your faith. I prefer that. That's a good analogy. I grew up very Baptist. I call myself a recovering Baptist. There are some things that were taught that just I needed to detangle from my faith as I got older. Some people don't fare well. They get angry when they find out that maybe God didn't say that in Scripture. It was man-made, self-taught stuff. And, and they get angry and they walk away from the faith. I, I do understand that there are times you need to reevaluate. But you don't get to rewrite. You can't look at Scripture and God clearly says something and say, yeah, but. Those are terrible things. Three terrible words that you could say after reading Scripture. Yeah, but I. Those are three terrible words. God says this, yeah, but I would rather do this. Or, yeah, but I think this is better. No, no. God said it. God meant it. And we submit to it. God is sovereign. And if he's not sovereign and you're picking and choosing, and this has been happening for a long time. One of our presidents was, was known for uh, taking the Bible and ripping it out. He just ripped out all the parts he didn't like. And it, uh, what was it called? The Jefferson Bible? I don't know. Which Bible was Which president? I don't, I, I don't want to smear any of our presidents. One of them is a jerk. And he, 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 he cut out parts of the scripture and made his Bible like, okay, here's a Bible that I like. No. We don't get that option, friends. Are there things that are uncomfortable in there? Yes, there are truths that are uncomfortable, especially today in the environment we live in. It's uncomfortable to say, yeah, but God says. But that's where we are. And we either say God is sovereign or you pick and choose what to follow and throw away parts you don't like. Specifically, that president didn't like anything that deified God, so all the miracles he took out, those can't be true. Uh, all the things that refer to Jesus as being God's son, I don't like that. We don't get to pick and choose. So this morning, what do we do? What do we do specifically when there's false teaching in the church well, surprisingly, I'm going to tell you, uh, we don't fight with anger. We don't fight with malice. We do preserve God's truth, but we don't do so in an ugly way. I find it interesting that Jude brings us to this point, and the word that he keeps repeating is mercy. Everybody say mercy. We show mercy. So let's talk through it this morning. Let's read the passage first, though. We're in Jude. Starting in verse 22, just verse 22 and 23. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy, mixed with fear, 
hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. We get to the end of Jude, and he's pointed out how false teachings entered, and, and boy, it's a problem. We, we can't let it ride. We can't let it just happen. So what do we do? Some people get there, and their answer is, let's fight. Let's cut them off at the head like a snake. You know, we'll, you know my wife hates snakes. Uh, and I'm glad we don't see a lot of them because she would expect me to do something. I got news for her. I'm running faster because I don't like snakes either. But you got a problem, you cut it off, right? And so some people think that that's the first option. Let's just cut it off. Well, let's listen to what Jude actually says. As believers, how we contend for the faith doesn't mean fighting or angry or bitterness, right? There's three levels that he talks about here. And I think, first of all, we need to understand that what we, what we need to talk about here is what is crucial, crucial theological issues. You might have pet peeve issues as a Christian, and you might think that those are essential, but they're usually not. Preface, preface issues are not critical issues. Some of you would say, I like the hymns only. That's great. I like the hymns too. But the Bible says make a new song. If we only rely on the hymns that were written centuries ago, are we obeying God's full command? So I like a mix. I like a blend. That's my personal preference. I like the new songs and the old songs. I think they're both great. But some of you might think that, that well, they're not doing it the way I prefer. I prefer hymns, so therefore, they're false teachers. No. Don't include stuff like that in this category that Jude's talking about. Don't cheapen it. I remember a man came to me once when I was young. Young Cole, you're not the only one that has cool hair. I had cool hair when I was your age. It's gone. I can't grow it anymore. It's sad. It goes away. I think I told you this before. I didn't know I was going bald. I never knew. I was, nobody told me. My wife hid it from me, apparently. I was speaking at a conference in front of about 3,000 teens, and they had those huge screens behind me, and they had a big camera down the middle. And I did this illustration where I did this thing, and I turned like this. And I got halfway around, and I saw my head on the screen. And I literally froze and reached up and went, what? And the crowd realized that was the first time I realized I had a bald spot. It was hilarious. But I had a guy come to me back when I was young and had cool hair. Eh, don't judge, but we're talking in the 80s. So it was parted down the middle and feathered back. Oh, my feather, it rivaled, you know, oh, it was awesome. Feathered. Blonde, feathered, parted down the middle. Had a man at my church come to me and say, young man, you need to cut your hair. You're offending me, and you're a stumbling block. Those are, those are key words. Boy, if you use that, you've won. That's like, that's like checkmate in chess. He's like, you've offended me, and you're a stumbling block. Oh, the Bible says, don't be a stumbling block. What does a stumbling block mean? It means that my actions might cause him to do the same. Problem was, he was bald. <laughs> the man had no hair. And I remember being a teen, I looked at him, I said, how can I be a stumbling block when you don't have any hair? But it didn't go well. <laughs> but let's not make, we're not talking about those issues. Yeah, some of you have uh, eschatology thoughts on end times. That's great. You know, join the thoughts of a million people for millennia, and, and, but realize if somebody doesn't teach your exact eschatology, it doesn't mean they're false teachers, there's room, there's room for disagreements on some issues. We're talking about what's crucial. We're talking about people coming in and saying, Jesus was a great guy, but not really God. He wasn't deity. No, no, that's a false teaching, and that shouldn't stand. Oh, Mary wasn't a virgin. That, that, that was just the old school. They were just so afraid of sex, and so they just made that up. No, we believe Jesus was born of a virgin. It's huge theologically, because if he wasn't born of a virgin, then he had man's sin imputed to him. That means he was born with a sin problem. No, Jesus was a perfect lamb of God, sinless. He was sinless from birth because he wasn't from Adam, and he was sinless by choice. He never sinned. That's huge. And so when people come along and say, ah, Jesus is just a good guy. He wasn't born of a virgin. It was just all that stuff they made up back then. No, these are things that we say no. No, we don't change those. One of the things that's popular today is nixing hell. Nobody goes to hell. Everybody gets to go to heaven. You know, God came and Jesus said to, to save the world. And so everybody goes to heaven or, or else Jesus doesn't get his wish. Well, I'm here to tell you that's a dangerous theology. 
The Bible is very clear. Unless you repent, you will perish. People need to be saved. If there's nothing to be saved from, why did Jesus die? And so these are certain, I'm trying to give you examples of both things that aren't critical that we shouldn't be worried about and things that that are critical. We need to know the difference. Let me, let's just, Romans 14, one through four. Let me read it for you. Romans 14, one through four. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything. Where did my ice cream go? They came and took it. Can you believe that? They came and took the ice cream. It's not allowed, I guess, in here. Gone. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Sorry, Margaret, don't get mad. I'm not picking on you, because the verse goes on to say, some people eat vegetables, and, and I'm not going to deny, they, they're looking good, and they're healthier than I am. Praise God for that. But these are choices people make. It goes on to say, the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. Ah, oh, It's hard. When you like bacon and people don't think you should eat bacon, it's hard to not get mad, right? But but the Bible goes on to say, don't, don't judge the one who does not, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. See, when it comes to issues we shouldn't be quarreling about, little pity little issues, God will take care of those things. Do do you realize we're all going to stand before a holy God someday, and he's probably going to tell me, hey, Don, you were wrong about a couple of things. Let me point them out to you. You're going to probably have some things that God's going to say, "Mm, you know, you you really had this thing that you told all your family and relatives every Thanksgiving that you really thought you were right about. Eh." He's going to correct all those things. It's not our job to correct those things. So let, again, don't sweat the petty stuff. Don't pet the sweaty stuff. Amen. Amen. Don't get caught up in quarreling. We don't need to be quarreling over things. But the main things, oh, the main things are, they are crucial. Who is God? Who is Jesus? What is the Bible? By the way, if you want to know the difference between a true church and and a cult, find out those answers. What do they teach about God? What do they teach about Jesus? What do they teach about God's word? Do they add to it, take away from it? These are critical things. And they're not, I mean, we're on on three. We haven't even gotten the the digits on one hand. Those are critical issues. So what do we do? There's three levels here in these two verses about people that have been influenced by the wolves. The first group simply says, be merciful to those who doubt. There are some that listen to this teaching and just say, well, I wonder, I don't know about this issue, I, I wonder. And they're not fully in yet, but they're, they're doubting. Maybe they're doubting some things. I, I break it down like this. They're wavering in their commitment. Have you seen people that waver after a while and they, maybe they're here and then all of a sudden we don't see them for a while. Do you know that that's all of our job? You know, you guys are creatures of habit. You know, you, you sit there. I know the clay sit there all the time. And I know certain people say, you guess what? There are people that sit around you the same way. You're sitting around people and you're like, yeah, I wonder where the clooks went. You know, if you don't see the clooks for four weeks, you ought to contact them, right? We, we, we are responsible for that as a church. Remember last week when I told you that it's uh, yourselves, not yourself? This is not an individual teaching. This is to the church. We need to be helping those. Be merciful, Here's a real deep definition of merciful, full of mercy. Bam. Be full of mercy to those who are wavering in their commitment. Let's reach out. Why don't we start doing that? Fall's coming. We're going back to two services. We'll have more room in the parking lot, more room in here to grow. Why don't we be taking it seriously to look around and say, who haven't I seen for a while? Give them a call. Hey, we we want you here. We want you here. You need us. We need you. Those who are doubting or waving in their commitment, maybe they're doubting the Bible. That happens when all of a sudden a culture says, God didn't really say that. 
that's not what God said. Or it doesn't mean what it really plainly sounds like it means. It means something totally different. And, and they, they hear those things and it can be upsetting. And so they start to doubt. Well, maybe this isn't true. Maybe these are words of misogynistic men who wrote in a day and age where women weren't respected. And so we can't trust it. Those are doubts that creep in. What do we do with people that are struggling? We don't have hate in our hearts for them. We love them. We're merciful to them. These are people that are struggling in their walk. Maybe they're young babes in Christ and they're walking with the Lord and then they fall back into sin. That happens. And so we ought to be people that are merciful, slow to judgment, but loving to these people. Uh, the word I want to use is invest. Everybody say invest. We invest in their lives. What does that mean? Investing means you give something. Uh, simply put, you can't invest without giving something. When you invest, you give money to something. I would rather have somebody come in and say, I don't, God created, did God create, or was it evolution? I just struggle with believing that God created. Good, struggle with that. Let me give you some books. There's some great things you should read as you're thinking about this. I love that. Don't think your pastor is going to look down on you if you have some doubts. I have some doubts. Things come up in my mind from time to time, and I'm like, God, this one's hard. But I always end on, but you are sovereign. It might be hard for me. It might be difficult for me to teach some of these things. But at the end of the day, that's what I'm called to do because God is sovereign. So I'm telling you today, if you doubt, you're welcome here. And we encourage you to keep pursuing truth. But pursue truth, not man's desires, as we talked about last week. All right, that's the easiest one. That's the, the lowest level. They're just starting to hear some falsehoods. Then it goes on to there. It says, save others who've been snatched, or save others by snatching them from the fire. This is a serious step. These people aren't just hearing false truths and having some doubts. They've started walking down the path of false teaching. So a couple of things I want to say about that. They have been drawn further away. This is scary. I mean, this is getting serious because Jude amped it up here. When he talked about people who doubted, he just simply said, be merciful to them. Then he moves into this category, snatch these from the fire. There's apparently a few more steps and they're in trouble, real trouble. So we snatch them from the fire. They've been drawn further away from God's truth. These people are also, they're in danger of judgment. That's why Jude makes it clear that there's a fire that they need to be snatched from heading into. I love how he makes that very clear. We have a job as a church to be helping people. And I do want to point this out. They need to be saved before it's too late. There are some people that have walked away from the elemental truths, like I talked about, who is God, who is Jesus, who am I? and the need of salvation, and how to have sins covered, all these issues, and if they've walked away from those, they're in danger of hell. And so we need to snatch people from the fire that have headed down this path. A verse I want to share with you is Proverbs 24, 11. 
Proverbs 24, 11 says, rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering toward the slaughter. I love that what imagery in Proverbs. Hold back those staggering toward slaughter. They have no idea. A bunch of cows. You ever been in the slaughterhouse? Don't go. It's not a fun afternoon for you and your children. For some reason, when I was in high school, my mom and dad encouraged me to work for Herbie. Herbie was a, I call him a millionaire hillbilly. He had a forklift company, made millions leasing out forklifts back in the 70s. But one of our, one of our customers was the meat market downtown Chicago on California Avenue. It's just a huge meat market. I'd never been there in my little suburban life, you know, suburban kid. Now I'm working for Herbie, and he's sending me to the meat market downtown Chicago. First day I rolled in, everybody's wearing white from head to toe with those hair nets, and they had a knife in each hand, and they're covered in blood. You roll up there, and you're 16, you're like, what? It's like a scene out of Friday the 13th. I'm like, what am I doing here? And those cows, they don't know. They're just living like, mm-hmm. They put their heads in the thing, and they're like, hello, what's in here? They have no idea. We've got people that head to the slaughter and they don't know that they're heading there. Matter of fact, they think they're pretty smart. They've thought this through and they've they've got these new thoughts. Be careful. And we need to be watching out for our brothers and sisters. When we hear of somebody who's, who's heading the wrong way, we need to care, not attack. We're snatching them from the fire, not attacking them, but we're lovingly helping them before we lose them. I love the term guardrails. Everybody say guardrails. Uh, people better out Oakwood have heard my stories. I was a rebellious teen and I uh, was making bad choices, drugging and drinking. And uh, this certain night, I wasn't drugging and drinking, but I was doing the wrong thing. We were heading. As I made a corner, my car just went straight off, hit the ditch, hit the guardrail. And I thought, oh no, and trying to hide it, trying to get away with it. And I get out thinking, how bad is it? And my tire had broke off the car, it snapped off. The, and my tire just lay. I'm like, mm, can't hide that. There is not enough duct tape, right, Dick? There's, no, there's not enough duct tape to fix that. I'm in trouble. I had to call my dad. I remember calling my dad. Back then, it wasn't grab your cell phone, by the way. I had to go to a house, knock on the door. Can I use your phone? And they let me call. Hey, Dad, I had an accident. Are you okay? I'm all right. I just ran off the road, and I hit a guardrail, and the tire came off the car. Then he said, well, where are you? (laughs) Busted. I said, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm at the corner of here. Wait, what are you doing there? I thought you told us you were over I don't believe in instant divine justice sometimes, but on that case, I think God just took my car and went, you're in trouble. (laughs) I think God does save church brats, by the way. Church brats, watch out. God loves you enough to not let you get away with it. That's my theology. You can disagree with that or not. The problem was I hit the guardrail. The good news is I hit the guardrail and it stopped me. The bad news is I hit the guardrail and mangled the guardrail. My dad got there, he'd called the tow truck. The tow truck got there and said, hurry, quick, let's get out of here before the cops come or you gotta pay for the guardrail. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, if they come, if the cops come, you get a ticket and you gotta pay for the guardrail. Let's go. We got out of there. Here's what I wanna tell us as a church and remind us. You need to be a guardrail in somebody else's life. Now listen, guardrails... Do not jump up and attack cars. Can you imagine if I called my dad that night and said, Dad, I was driving down the road and this guardrail came up and attacked the car. He'd be like, okay, (laughs) we're going to get you help, son. (laughs) Guardrails don't attack. You know what guardrails do? And I guarantee this. Go ahead and research it if you want to. Guardrails stand firm between you and certain death. That's what guardrails do. They stand firm and don't let you go over the cliff. That's what we do as believers. You need to be a guardrail in somebody else's life. Stand firm, don't attack. 
We got the, it was terrible back in the 90s. We got this idea that accountability, the word accountability, it, it, people started running away from the church because we were talking about accountability. We need accountability. We need, and you know what accountability meant? It was code word for slapping you up inside the head with a two by four. That's what accountability was. Back in the 90s, people would, like, I'm your accountability partner, and you're doing this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. That, ah! No, accountability is not me telling you what, I, what you should do. Accountability is actually me reminding you of what you said God wanted you to do. Accountability is supposed to be merciful, loving, but firm. And guess what? Guardrails get mangled. Let me tell you that again. Guardrails get mangled. It's not fun sometimes to be the guardrail in somebody else's life because when they're running out of control and they're going to head off that cliff and you're the only thing standing there and you're going to take that, it's hard to be a guardrail. It's hard to stay loving, firm, unmovable, yet merciful. But you're called to be a guardrail. That's one Point two, you better have guardrails in your life. That's the beauty of the Christian walk. You need to be a guardrail, and you better have guardrails. You're like, I don't need a guardrail. I'm a professional guardrail. I'll guardrail everybody else. Take heed, those who think they stand, lest they fall. Never think that you're above having a guardrail. I tell the story about my friend Cliff. Cliff Washburn um, was my, one of my best friends. He was my best man in my wedding. I love Cliff Washburn. When I got to Cornerstone uh, back in the day, yes, it was Grand Rapids Baptist way back in the day, Cole, not as cool. My wife actually graduated from Cornerstone University. I graduated from Grand Rapids Baptist two, two years before her. It changed names, and so they got the cool name. I got the dumb name. And so uh, I, I went to that school and met Cliff, and Cliff was the BMOC. You know what a BMOC is? These kids didn't invent these kind of things, but we had them back in the day. BMOC means big man on campus. Cliff was, he was, he, he was Captain Comet. Back in when we were Grand Rapids Baptist College, we were the Comets. That was our name, Grand Rapids Baptist Comets. And, that, and he became, we had no, we had no uh, what do they call those people? Mascots. We didn't have a mascot, so Cliff invented one. He became Captain Common. He wore leotards, put on these things, and every home basketball game at halftime, we knew it was going to happen. They'd clear the courts for halftime, and Cliff would run, and he would jump on one of those mechanic wheelie things and slide across the whole court, and we'd go nuts. He was crazy. Cliff was nuts. I got to college, and I'm like, this guy's crazy. Everybody loves this guy. And he was a leader on campus. He was an RA. He was part of Uh, Student chapels, which, by the way, Cole is part of that team today, too. It's really cool, the legacy. Cliff was part of one that led student chapels. I so admired Cliff. So many people admired Cliff. I became Cliff's best friend. We lived together in the dorm. He took, I think, seven years to do four years. And so he was older than me, but he was still in school. And so by the time I became a junior and senior, I was the RA, and he was in my section, in my room, actually. And I'm the guy in charge of keeping the rules and everything. And Cliff... Took a dive. He just, he went from being a godly Christian leader that everybody, and he just made a couple of choices and it took him off the path and he had fallen far. And it broke my heart. Here's a guy that everybody looked up to, now he's not walking with Jesus. I only gave one, we call them J's, I don't know what you call them now, it's a $2 fine. In my whole two years of being an RA, you're supposed to give fines and stuff. I only gave out one. It was to my roommate, Cliff. He tried to sneak in after hours by knocking on my window and say, let me in. Dude, I'm the RA. You're busted. You know, it was easy. Only time I ever gave a fine to my friend, Cliff. And I realized watching him walk away that it was, it was heartbreaking. So I decided to be a guardrail in my friend's life. I took him home. I called him and said, hey, listen, you, you don't have a life right now. You're coming with me to Chicago for Thanksgiving. And he's like, yeah, but I said, no, no, you're coming. And I made Cliff go with me to Chicago to spend Thanksgiving. We drove from Grand Rapids to Chicago. We had Thanksgiving. I, the whole way there, I was talking to Cliff about life and what's going on. And on the way back, I'm talking to Cliff, and I'm, my heart is just heavy, and I'm just pouring out to my friend. We, God loves you, Cliff, and you never have gone too far. And I'm just begging Cliff, begging him. And he said at one point, somewhere in Indiana, it's only like, what, 
35 miles of Indiana when you're on 94. Somewhere in that little stretch, Cliff said, that's it, pull over. And I pulled over off the side of 94 and he got out and walked to the front of the car and got on his knees and he surrendered his life back to Jesus. I needed Cliff when I got to Cornerstone because I was drugging and drinking and heading the wrong direction and he became my guardrail. Later on, when he fell, I became his guardrail. And here I am, a pastor of a church. Cliff's a pastor in Florida. We're both serving the Lord. Thank God for guardrails. Are you a guardrail in somebody's life? Do you have guardrails set up in your life? That's the principle here that we're talking about. The word I want to use is intervene. Everybody say intervene. intervene. The first word was invest. Everybody say invest. Yes. Everybody say intervene. intervene. So investing means you give something. Intervene means you do something. Don't just stand there and watch. Do something. Loving, merciful, and patient, but intervene in people's lives. Snatch them from the fire. There's a third group, and it's a really sad one. This is the, uh, the group that he speaks the most mm, specific about. Show mercy mixed with fear to the worst offenders. I think when he's here, he's not just talking about people that have been affected by false teachers. I think he's talking about people who've become false teachers. So this is the worst group that they've gone, they're all in. Uh, let's look at what this group means. It, it means that these people are fully immersed in false teaching. They've just gone down the path of God's not sovereign, I'm sovereign, I'll tell you what truth is, don't listen to God. They have gone far. And with this group, it is interesting that he brings up be merciful again, but it needs to be mixed with fear. Everybody say fear. He has great songs you picked, um, Tracy. Two of the songs talked about fear. <laughs> And the Bible says, do not be afraid, do not fear. So all of a sudden, we've got a verse here that's telling us, be merciful mixed with fear. Well, which is it? No fear or fear. Understand the word here does not mean fear, being afraid. And it actually means be cautious, be cautious. In other words, there are groups that have gone so far that you need to be merciful to, you need to reach out to, but guard yourself lest you get sucked in. See, that's the danger. And Jude's telling us, hey, you know, you know truth, stick to truth. Those who are wandering from the truth, be merciful and go to them and be a part of them, but watch yourself, guard yourself lest you fall. These people are fully immersed they are not beyond redemption, though. Amen? That's such a good thing. Aren't you glad that there's not uh, too far is too far and you're too far gone? I love the fact that no matter where you're at in life, if you just stop running and turn, Jesus is there. He's been following. He's been chasing you the whole time. You're never too far gone. And we need to, we need to understand that. We need, to, we need to really operate in that lane that God can save I mean, just look at who he chose. Paul. Paul wrote more than half of the New Testament. When God grabbed him, he was persecuting and killing Christians. I mean, he's on the wrong team. You talk about going too far. Paul had gone too far. Not for God, amen? When God needed a pastor. He, he, he reached to some church brat, drugging and drinking, selling drugs, making a mess of his life, and he says, he'll do. And he grabbed me, and he never let me go. I love the fact that no one's too far gone. Let's not write people off. Let's care, let's pray, let's do what we need to do. Matter of fact, I think that's what we're told to do here. We should show mercy by praying for that person and being kind to them. Kindness works, friends. It just, being ugly and attacked doesn't work. Kindness, pray for them. That kindness doesn't mean you agree with them. You need to be a guardrail, stand firm. Plant yourself in the truth and stay there. But pray for them and be kind. That's mercy for those people. But we should be cautious. Guard yourself. That mercy mixed with fear. Be careful lest you fall. I love this verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Teenagers, write that verse down. Parents of teenagers, say that out loud every day at home. 
Do not be dis- misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So be careful. We don't go to them wanting to become like them. That's one of the things that people don't understand when they say, well, Jesus loved people. He spent time with the prostitutes and the sinners. And, the, and Yes, yes, he did, but he didn't do so to become like them. Matter of fact, those people that came near Jesus that were deep in sin were changed, amen? So don't be changed, change others. I, I tell the teens when I travel and speak, uh, it's the difference between a, a thermostat and a thermometer. You guys know the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer, right? See, a thermostat we put on the wall, we lock it in a glass cage over there. Don't touch it. Thermostats have some power. There's only a few people that have keys here. Some of us have achieved the rank of app on our phone. Some of y'all are cold every week, and you're like, if I can only break into that box, don't even try it. It's on my phone. I'm going to put it down, 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 down. Pastor's a sweater. I'm hot all the time, and I sweat profusely. That fan's got to be pointed in the right direction every Sunday. And so that thing there, we guard it. Thermostats change the temperature in a room. Thermometers don't. You ever been sick? Your mama comes with that thermometer, and she puts it hopefully in your mouth. <laughs> Put it underneath your tongue. I hope you didn't think that that fixes your illness. Did did you think that that thermometer goes in and it changes the temperature? No, that thermometer has no power to change anything. It simply becomes like the environment it goes into. A thermometer becomes exactly what the environment it goes into. It just tells you what that temperature is. Do not be a thermometer Christian. Don't enter into groups and become like them. Be a thermostat. Change the temperature in the room, amen? Some of y'all have been more excited about that. That was a really good illustration. I'm going to send you home today. No ice cream. All right. Show mercy mixed with fear. I have to do it. Some of you really aren't going to like it, but I can only teach what the Bible says. He says, have mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. What's going on here? What does this mean? I do not mean to be crass. I mean to give you a clear picture. He's talking about the clothing closest to the body that they wore. Your underwear. (laughs) Our skivvies. Hating even the garments. Stained by bodily functions. Ah, That's a gross illustration. I know it and I apologize. Let me go further. As a youth pastor, we, we used to make all the kids on missions trips. We'd have 2018s going on a missions trip, and we knew in Brazil and Mexico and other places that we would end up having to do laundry. So everybody's clothes had to be numbered. So I assigned a number to everybody, and they were to take a black Sharpie and write their number on all their clothing, all their clothing. That way, when we did laundry, it was easy. You folded all the numbers, da, da, da. Somehow, all the boys' underwear were marked with a brown one. Thank you if you followed me or not. Jim followed me. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. It's just a fact of life, and it stinks. I think that's what Jude is trying to say. Guard yourself, people, because sin stinks, and it's wretched, and it affects things. Are you guarding yourself, Christian? That has to be your first priority. You're no good to anybody if you're no good. As your pastor, I need to be close to God because if I have nothing to give, I have nothing to give. If you want to be of good, then you've got to make sure that you're keeping yourself in God's word, growing and learning and strong, standing firm on God's truth. And then we can be of some good to help those. Okay, third word. What's the first word? Invest. What's the first word? Invest. What's the second word? intervene. I had a hard time coming up with the third I. It was harder than you can imagine. Here's what we're going to do. Don't judge me. I ended up with be intrepid. Be intrepid in their rescue. What does intrepid mean? Because I had to do a lot of thesaurus work to find up with an I word that would work. It means dauntless. It means be heroic. In this third group, you're a guardrail, but you're a guardrail that's going up against a a Mack truck. (laughs) And you probably get mangled by standing firm in the faith here, but be intrepid. 
be dauntless, be heroic. What, what is a hero? A hero is simply somebody who sees clearly has an irresistible urge to act. It's a good definition of what a hero is. A hero is simply somebody who sees clearly and has an irresistible urge to act. You know what the problem is? The problem is we don't see clearly. We're fogged in. When you're fogged in, you're, 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 you can't see clearly, so you don't have any... And so we're in our own worlds and we're fogged in. We come in, we run out. We don't take time to, to know people. One of the reasons why we gather together is because one of the ministries that's happening is just there when we're encouraging one another and we're getting to know one another and we're stepping into people's lives. That's why we gather. That's why it's important to come. It's not all about you. It's for you so that we together can help encourage and love one another and support one another in this walk. So what do we do? I got good news for you today. It's not about being angry. It's not about being bitter. It's not about going on the attack. It's about being merciful and loving people. Those who doubt, those who are walking further away, and those who have jumped off the cliff. Be a guardrail. Amen? Team, come on up and close us out today. Father God, we do thank you. We thank you for... Your word that teaches us to be dauntless, valiant. God, that we would look not only to our own needs, but to the needs of others. And Father, if we have friends that are flirting with falsehood, walking away from your sovereignty, your word being true, God, that we would be believers who care. Not only guarding our own hearts, but being a guardrail in others' lives. Help us to live this out, we pray in Jesus' name. Stand with us as we sing.
you to give toward Cole's love offering, but you only have like 10 minutes to do that. So don't get wandered around too much because the uh, people need to take that, go in and count it and make sure we have that number. So if you're going to do that, do it pretty quickly. Don't be in a hurry, everybody. Let's take a deep breath. You can be here for another five, six minutes. Go out there, sign up for the ice cream, sign up for the dinners for six, sign up for SOS. You got lots of sign up. Get the pens going. God bless. Have a good night.